everyone. We want to welcome you today to the We Are Floor Pro podcast. I am your host, Latasha J. Humphrey. In a moment, we're going to jump into this amazing podcast. But before we get started, we want to let our audience know that this podcast is being brought to you by the Floor Pro Foundation, where our vision is bridging the gap, building a legacy. Our mission is that we are a 501c3 community focused nonprofit mentoring organization building healthy relationships and partnerships between women and girls through education, community service, networking, unification, and career planning. Our inspiration is Flora Pearl Humphrey. She was my paternal grandmother, and although she passed away in 2001 of a massive heart attack, what she taught me and my family was about faith, family, and community. And that is where I draw my inspiration from. Now, audience, I have the pleasure to introduce to you a woman who has a powerful testimony. We met some years back through a mutual friend and remain connected via social media since that time. She is living proof that you can survive and thrive in life no matter the obstacles, as long as your faith is strong and you have a relentless grit. I respect her as a woman who is living on purpose. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Shanique Stinson. Hi, Shanique. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Awesome. You know, it's such an honor to have you with us today. And if you would, just briefly go ahead and introduce yourself to our audience. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shanique Stinson, and I'm... uh, resident out in the Center Point community, and I'm a teacher out in Mountain Brook, and I'm the parent to four handsome young boys, and I am a breast cancer survivor celebrating my 10-year anniversary this weekend. Woo-woo! Awesome! Yes. Look. <laughs> well, congratulations to you definitely Thank on you. that. You're welcome. That is, that is just so... That's just a really incredible. And so um, so we definitely applaud you and give you kudos and um, on that. And, you know, just you being, um, you know, a 10 year um, breast cancer and you like you call it the survivorship, you know, yeah. uh, that's really cool. And, I, you know, I have to say, though, that you are I feel like it's a lifetime breast cancer survivor because there's absolutely no chance of it returning in your life. Um, So that chapter is done. So, yeah, we're done with that. But I I definitely wanted you to share, though, and, you know, just even kind of walk us through, you know, when you found out about it, you know, when were you diagnosed and, you know, basically how you made it through that time. And then what has been the key to, you know, your success and you remaining free after it? Okay. Well, I was diagnosed back in 2007. Um, in January of 2007, it was actually January, um, I think it was New Year's Day, I was taking a shower, and um, I was bathing off, and you know how you wash up under your armpits, etc. and I felt a hump in my armpit where, you know, normally it's just flat and smooth, but mine had like a hump in it, you know, kind of like, I guess then it probably felt like maybe the size of a maybe a tennis ball maybe, but it wasn't that swollen, but just the width of it in my armpit. Yeah. And so um, at that time, I had um, what some of us, maybe quite a few here in Birmingham, I'm not for sure if it still exists now with the changes to Cooper Green Hospital and everything, but I had a blue card. Okay. And um, I had doctors over at Cooper Green Hospital, and they diagnosed me there. And like I said, I found it. I called the doctor, and they called me in to get a mammogram. Got the mammogram done, and they did tell me they saw a shadow there. So they called me back in two weeks later, which is how the the county works. You know, you don't see everybody the same day or get a quick next available appointment. So two weeks later, I go in, and I get the fine needle aspiration done. And they drew the fluid off, and they sent it off to the lab to be tested. And two weeks later, they called me back in, and um, they told me that it was positive, and they were going to do a um, biopsy on it and get the results to find out exactly what stage and everything I was in. So fast forward to the result day after the biopsy, which was March 1st, 
2007, I was diagnosed with breast cancer at Cooper Green Hospital. And the doctor that I had then, I won't call his name, but he was very, a man, um, I don't mean to sound like Cam knew. I might need to rephrase right. that. But, you know, <laughs> no, um, <right>. men, <laughs> men are kind of, you know, not as nurturing as we as women are. And he just walked in the room and he was like, Miss Stanson, he said, I have your results. You have breast cancer. And he turned around and he walked out the room. Oh, wow. That was it. And I'm like, what What did he just say? My mom, she was sitting there with me. She was like, don't get upset. She was like, we're going to pray. And we prayed. And I was crying. And the nurse came back in. And she was like, are you okay? I was like, yeah, you just told me I had breast cancer. But that was it. He didn't tell me nothing else, you know. So leaving there, went home. And I called my aunt, Thelma. Well, she works over at UAB um, in the cancer department. And she was like, okay, we got the diagnosis, but we're not going to accept it until we get a second opinion. So she was like, I need you to ask for your medical records. We're going to have everything sent over to Kirkland Clinic. And she said, I'm going to set you up with somebody, and we're going to get your me- medical records sent there. So that's what we did. Because at Cooper Green, they wanted to do surgery first. And with the size that the tumor was at the time, if they had to remove that tumor then, I'm not for sure if I would be here or if it would have turned out totally different. Because when I got to Kirkland Clinic, I met my team of doctors, um, which was turned out to be a great team. I still love them to this day. Um, they gave me chemo first versus at the counter they wanted to cut me first. So they gave the chemo, shrunk it, then I did surgery with the remaining tumor that was left from the shrinkage, and then I did radiation. So they weren't removing a 3.8 tumor as what it was initially, but a 1.9 because the chemo shrunk it in half. Mm -hmm. So I still have my breast to this day, and versus there, I think by them removing a tumor that big, it probably would have been very dense and sunken in, you know. So I make a joke out of it, you know, just to keep the humor in my life and not be so depressed about it. I call my left breast where the tumor was at my before baby breast because it sits up all nice and perky. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> and my right breast, I call it the after baby breast, you know, so... Ten years later, I'm just now deciding and thinking that I really do want to have the reduction done because with certain clothes that I wear, I have to maybe pad myself because it's a two-inch difference. So if I wear something kind of not clean but tight-fitting, not necessarily tight-tight, but you get what I'm saying, you can see the difference in it yeah. versus if I wear something loose. You know, and you can't really just tell, tell them that you're just there, you know. So, um, during the Christmas holidays, I'm thinking about having, um, the school will be out by me being a teacher. I'll be on Christmas break. I think I'm going to have the procedure during the end. And I think that'll be, um, the final thing that I have done. Because at first I said, when I get married, whomever I date or whomever I marry, they just don't have to like it the way it is, and I'm just done. I'm not getting cut on anymore because I'm tired of being cut on, you know. So that's what my initial thought was. But this summer when I went to the beach and had my swimsuit, I was like, ooh, you really can tell, you know. And I was just thinking to myself, you know. So it's like now I want it done just for me, you know what I'm saying, not for nobody else but for me. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. But um, it was a journey. It was life-changing, you know. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, but, you know, it brought me and my family closer, you know. Um, it was a trying time, especially with me having my four boys, because they were all small kids then. Um, mm-hmm. My oldest is 23, so he was 13. Wow. And then um, my second one was like six or seven, and then five and three maybe. So they were all young, you know, and with the diagnosis that I was given, you know, my prayer every day was, Lord, please let me live to see my kids grow up and get old and see them have kids, you know, because it was kind of not so good diagnosis with, you know, my stage and everything and the type that I had. Right. 
Right. Yeah. And and really kind of looking back on that when like you said, I mean, and you know, sometimes I I mean, you, even when you talked about the doctors kind of like some people may not know how to deliver news. And- um, exactly. Or just period. And, and, you know, I mean, it could be whomever, just like you said, as far as saying some things. But but even in that moment, <laughs> I, I guess the keeper probably being mad at him, it was just kind of like just how. OK, so he walks out and it's like, what do what do we do from here? Like, what what were yeah. your thoughts in that moment? And I know you said, you know, your mom was there. So that's a great, you know, just even having her there as a support. But yeah. just did you did at any point, like in that moment, like did your life kind of just flash before you? It did. Because when he told me everything, which they confirmed at um, the follow up at the second opinion. Yeah. You know, it was just like, you know, okay, this is what it is. But they delivered it better, you know. It's all in the deliverance and yeah. anything that you do, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, as far as your bedside man is going to be in a doctor, you know, it's just the delivery. You know, he could have said, um, Ms. Stetson, I hate to inform you, but with your test results, you have breast cancer. This is the stage. This is this. This is that. You yeah. know, instead of just saying you have breast cancer. My nurse is going to come in and she'll give you your follow-up right. appointment. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So when I get to the next doctor, you know, it's the team. I met the team the first day. I met the person who was going to put my port in. I met my um, oncologist. I met the surgeon. And I met my radiation doctor. It's just like, for lack of better words, you know, when you got this other type of insurance in your hand that I went and picked up at work because at that time it was open season coming up, you know, so I was able to pick that insurance up. It's like, here at the county, this is the treatment you get, but when you got this Blue Cross Blue Shield card in your hand, this is the service you get. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, at that point, you know, it was just kind of life changing and I did see my life flash, you know. And I was like, okay. My mom was like, okay, you had this pity party for a couple of days, but after this, we got to start fighting, you know. And I did. I cried, you know, and I tried to keep my composure for my kids because, like I said, they were small. Right. And, you know, I just got them all four up in the bed. And um, by me being a single parent, at first I had a queen size bed, and then I'll wake up all four of us in the bed. You know, I was like, this ain't going to work. <laughs> I got to get a king-size bed. Right. So I got a king-size bed, and this king-size bed has served a purpose to this day. You know, even when my college son comes home, he's still let to put in my bed, and we'll talk, you know. Uh, yeah. And at some point, they are all coming in the room. So with that king-size bed, I told them what was going on, you know, mm-hmm. just like, you know, in the terms where they could understand it, you know, that mommy is sick, I'm going to lose my hair, and da 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 you know. And just broke it down to a point where they could understand, of course, the tears came, you know. But I said, Mama's going to be all right. I'm going to be here, you know. But just know that these things are going to happen, you know. Yeah. And so life went on, you know. Um, I started my first treatment, diagnosed March 1st, um, April the 11th. Um, I received my first treatment at Kirkland Clinic, and that's where I've been ever since then. But before I started that treatment, this is something that's going to maybe jump ahead, but I'm not for sure what your next question may be. But um, April the 8th of 2007 was Easter Sunday. Mm. And I went to church that Sunday, and my pastor, which is also slash my uncle, called me up to the altar during an altar call. And, you know, I was doing the Baptist church of the Anuncia here with oil. Mm-hmm. And he asked me, he said, do you believe that you can be healed? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, do you really believe that you can be healed? I was like, yes, I do. He said, raise your hands. I don't remember anything after that point. Wow. So for those who have experienced, you know, being purged, being under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you know, um, that's what I experienced that day. And... Of course, when I got in the car, this just how quick the enemy tried to come in against me. 
I looked in the mirror and my face, it was just, looked like it was just shiny, like just clear and clean. But my eyes, they were spotted like somebody had to poke me in my eyes with a stick pen. Wow. And so initially, first off, Mama, did y'all let me fall about my head? <laughs> you know? Right, right. And she's like, no, we caught you before you hit the floor, you know? And I was like, well, my eyes look like they're just bloodshot all over. So, of course, she's like, if it makes you feel better, we go to the emergency room. So I went to the emergency room. And the emergency room doctor, they did a CAT scan, and he looked at my eyes. He said, yeah, you do have some hemorrhaging in your eyes. He said, but there's no bleeding on your brain. So whatever you experienced at church, it did nothing to you. He said, sometimes when you're vomiting and you're doing your thing, you know, you can bust blood vessels in your eyes. He said, that's all that's happened to you. So, you know, sometimes so now if I vomit, you know, or we vomit, you may get a little blood vessel burst because you're straining, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? Oh, wow. Yeah. So, went home and, okay, I'm fine. Nothing's wrong. Three days later, I got the first set of my... Um, chemo treatment, I had to get it in my arm, and it was called the andreomycin. And so that's the one that takes your hair out, and they call it the red devil through the hospital term. And he said, you're going to lose your hair three weeks to date. True enough, I lost my hair exactly three weeks to the date. So um, May 1st, I had my port put in my chest, and then I had my second chemo treatment through the port. Mm-hmm. But um, after the second treatment, they do a test to see, you know, how well your body is responding to the chemo. So my doctor, Dr. Andres Ferrero, he gave me the report after I got my second treatment. You can always go see the doctor afterwards. He was like, um, I've never seen anything like this before. And he was like, um... I don't know what to tell you. My mama, she was like getting upset and frantic. He was like, no, 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 no. He had, he's from Columbia. He has a very strong accent. He says, no, no, no. He said, tumor already responded to chemo. Mm, That's mm-hmm. after the second one. Mm. And he was like, you know, I've never seen anything like it. Then she went to another level, you know. Right. Praise <laughs> God. And like, so, oh, I already knew it. He's like, my baby's been here, so he's like, whatever your belief is, he's like, you keep it up. He's like, because this thing is working. But he was like, she still has to go through mm-hmm. everything. So I'm still having to be tested and go through all these drugs, which he said was poison that they were putting inside. So chemotherapy drugs are poison, you know, and they're made to cure us in a certain form. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it may come back, sometimes it stays away. Like in my case, I'm cancer-free 10 years later. Yeah. So, you know, but to say all this, I still had to go through the test with getting all the chemotherapy, the adjunctive drugs, and the Herceptin, and the radiation, which burned my skin down to the pinkness, but with my grandmother's help, she mixed me up some cocoa butter, some olive oil, and aloe vera juice, and it brought my skin back just pretty on my neck and my breast. Aww. And I just had like a little splot just there, you know. But, um, so it's like you still, anything that we do in life, you know, with God, sometimes we still have to go through in order to get to the upside. You know, no matter how much it might hurt us, we still come out, you know, unscathed. But you go through, and it's just to get you through your test so you can have a testimony. So that's basically what I had to go through, even though, you know, with the burning of my skin and the surgery, which while my surgeon, she was great. When I tell you this lady cut me around my areola, Mm -hmm. on my breast, and, I mean, perfection, straight on the line, I mean, it's no scar there at all. The only thing you can tell is that it's like a little where the tumor was, you know, yeah. but it's starting to peel back out there. But, you know, you can just still tell that's where it was. But, I mean, no scars, no nothing. It's like you can't even tell, like I said, you know, you go through things in life and God will take you, you know, but you just have to have faith and believe and, you know, you'll come out 
on the women's side. That's all I can say, you know, about that. It was a test in wearing no bras to work and doing things, you know, walking around with galls on, you know, to keep the dust and germs from getting on the skin. But, and that's another thing, you know, some people go through chemo and they barely are able to get up out of bed during the day. But I worked the whole time I was receiving chemotherapy, except for the day that I went to go get treatment, I worked a half a day. And that usually my treatments were on Wednesdays. So that Thursday I wouldn't go to work out with rest. And then I would be back at work. I would have some vomiting, you know, throughout the day. And my teacher, co-teacher who I work with, she's like, just go in the bathroom. I got the class. You just go. Some days I was weak, but, and what I went through, the doctor was like, he was just like, I can't believe you're working, you know. So that's why I say, you know, if you have the faith and you go through things in life, you know, God is there with you. Because like I said, the poor footprints in the sand, I stood on it because it was days I didn't know how I was walking around. But it was then that I knew, like, the poor say God cared me. Yeah. 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 And and I wanted to, I, I think, you know, just even with that, uh, pretty much like what, what has been your key after that? Because that's huge. Like when you talk about like being able to still work, I mean, some people, that's not it. And do you, well, I'll ask you this. Do you feel like that was, you know, in you getting through it that you did? And like you said, even your mom was like, you know, hey, I'm going to give you a minute, but we got to get back grinding at it. Like, you know, we got to put put our faith in action and, you know, you have a work to do. So, I mean, uh-huh. you know, I know your boy is definitely an inspiration to want to continue living. And, and like you said, I want to see my grandchildren's children, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and so do you feel like that was your key of even going through it and also being free now, like staying free? Cause sometimes in other cases we you hear, you know, it comes back or whatever, but how do you feel? I mean, definitely your faith in, in your belief. I know that's strong. I mean, that can cure anything, uh-huh. um, you know, and you believe in that, that God is a healer. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, but with that, how was that grit? Like, cause it, that's why I said in the intro, like that relentless grit. That that's huge. We're still working, and yeah, you know, just, just like you were like, I'm not giving up. Yeah, I'm not, and that was the thing. I I had to keep pushing, and like the doctor said, you have two things that were on your side, and he said that was my race and my age. Because like I said, I was diagnosed at 31. I turned 32 that July. I was diagnosed that March. I turned 32 that July, mm-hmm. and my race. He said, those were two things that I had in my favor. And he said, I'm going to tell you another thing. He's like, this is mind over matter. He was like, if you come in this with a negative thinking, mm. he said, you're going to have negative results. Okay. And that's what that thing in life. You know, if you think negative, you're going to have negative results because you can't do anything in life or, you know, speak things in your life and you still have a negative tongue. Where it's like, you know, you're saying, okay, I don't have no money, but you're still working. So Mm. what are you going to do to continue to get that money, you know, to make an increase, you know? Yeah. So it's just like the scripture in the Bible says, faith without works is dead. So if I didn't have the faith and believe that I knew God was a healer and I knew I've heard these stories and I knew I've heard these different things about what he could do, then of course I'm going to think okay, God, I know you got me. I'm going to read my healing scriptures. I'm going to do this. Mm. And I'm just going to believe. But at the same time, if I had that negative thought in the back of my mind, then of course, you know, it's not going to work. Yeah. So you have to stay positive in everything, you know. And of course, sometimes it gets us down, you know, but you still just have to believe. Absolutely. And so I just think that was my biggest thing, my belief. And that he wasn't going to take me away from my kids, you know, and that I was going to make it through. And that's what I had to believe, and that's how I had to live. I just kept going like I knew it was there. And sometimes, even now, look, Tasha, um, it's so surreal, you know, because I know that the type of breast cancer I had and the way my tumor was in all the negatives that I had against me at that time, besides the two positives that I had, Mm -hmm. you know, I could have been just gave up, you know, because when they come to you and they tell you, okay, you have 
stage three breast cancer, triple negative, HER2 new positive. Those things right there, mm-hmm. and then the size of the tumor, triple negative breast cancer, that's one of the worst parts of breast cancer that you can have. Mm. Mm. You know, and then the stage that it was in, and then it had spread from my breast to my lymph nodes. So when I went into surgery, okay, I'm thinking, okay, Lord, I'm just trying not to freak out. So when I told the doctor when I got there, they had already set me up to get um, a lumpectomy. So when I got in, I was like, okay, you know, if you see anything else, what are you going to do? She was like, when we get there, we'll do it. She's like, if I have to do anything else, I'll wake you up and I'll let you know that we have to do more. Okay. So when I'm going into the operating room, I'm looking up and I'm just thinking on a team 23rd song. So when I look at the operating room number, it was 7-Eleven. Mm. Okay. So I went into surgery and I come out of surgery, go to the recovery room. And guess what my room number was? What? <laughs> <laughs> my room number was 811. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, you know, seven is a number of completion. completion. Yeah. And then the number eight is new, new beginnings. beginnings. Right. And the one. So I'm like, okay, Lord. <laughs> and I told my mom, and she was like, oh, my God. And I was like, yeah, so... That's what I always remember. I was like, okay, God, I have completed this journey of my breast cancer. I'm in the surgery. I'm going to wait on my results after the surgery. They tell me what was what. And then we're going to have this new beginning. And that's exactly the way it was. was Because when they sent my um, lymph nodes off to the pathologist, when they were in surgery, you know, they put the dye in your armpit since it had spread to my lymph nodes. And when they put the dye in, 11 of my lymph nodes lit up like they had cancer in them. But when they sent it to the pathologist, only one lymph node had cancer in it. So even though they had to scoop a lot of my lymph nodes out and um, I lost them and then, you know, so on that arm, I don't have to put deodorant. That's the crazy thing. I don't have to put the odor up under one of my arms. What? Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> what? Like, in I what only, world does that work? <laughs> <laughs> and I only have to shave one armpit. Really? <laughs> and it's on my right side. No hair grows on that armpit anymore. Oh, wow. Um, I don't get perspiration in front of that armpit. So I don't have to use deodorant. So my deodorant lasts a little longer now. Oh, okay, okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> and so even though I lost the lip note, and so um, now when I put lotion on my body, I have to constantly remind myself to put my lotion on in an upward motion because I develop lymphedema in this arm. But it's not as bad as you see some women. Mm-hmm. Some women's arms get really big and swollen. But mine is just minimal. If I wear my sleeve like I'm supposed to, it doesn't, you know. So um, sometimes I have to buy my shirts, long sleeve shirt, and a size up. But I say all this and that is, you know, back to what I said. You know, we have to go through things, but on the upward end, it always turns out good because only one of my lymph nodes had cancer in it, so that lets me know that she got all of it out. You know, yeah. and I still had to get the radiation, but it was still gone. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So we have to go through things in life to get to where we actually have to be. So that's how I look at everything that happened in that area. You know, because even with me, when I received the Herceptin, I wasn't having a menstrual cycle. And that's where they think it came from, because I've been on every type of birth control pill everything to get my cycle regulated because I never had a normal cycle, so to speak. So I was on um, the depth of air shot after I had my first son and I gained so much weight, but I didn't have any more babies for six years. But then that's what it's like. That's, um, that's not healthy for you not to have a menstrual cycle. But it took me off the depth of air. So... 
um, in the time of me switching, because my first son was six, and they took me off of Depavera in between me switching to birth control pills, I got pregnant. Oh, wow. So that's when I got pregnant with my second baby. And then I got back on birth control. And I'm still not having a normal cycle. Because you know you're supposed to have your cycle at the last pill on that last green color. So it still wasn't working. So I've been on uh, just about every birth control. So then they started putting me on the uh, progesterone. Um, and... And, um... I had to take the first pills for the first 10 days of the month. And um, my cycle was supposed to come on. It still wasn't working. So my mom said when I was in surgery, the same medicine that I was on, it came up in the, um, you know how they had a little infomercial come on when you'd be in the hospital if you're taking this medicine or if you had this mesh put in your body, you may be susceptible to getting a lot of coming in on a lot of things. So, um, when I got out of surgery and got out of the hospital, because I developed pneumonia after the surgery, I was in the hospital for a couple of days, the lawsuit had closed. The class thing that I could have gotten in on had closed. Mm -hmm. So, um, there was no family history, no nothing, so they don't know exactly where my breast cancer came from. Wow. So I did the BRCA testing and everything, and, um, it said that I shouldn't be susceptible to get it again. So, um, it was kind of crazy because I don't know where it came from. And that's the only thing they can track it down to is the medicine because my body had too much estrogen and my body wasn't doing what it's supposed to do with it. So they were giving me progesterone to kind of calm it down. So. That's the only thing they could see where it came from was taking all those different meds. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, I I do want you to speak, you know, to definitely to women. Um, and we know, you know, in in some cases it's a, maybe a smaller percentage, but even men, you know, um, may be susceptible to um, breast cancer. And so I wanted to um to you know just have you to say something to them to stress the, about the importance of even getting consistent. Um, mammograms. Mm -hmm. So for the ladies, um, even now, like we get thirties and mid thirties, but now you know some women. I think they've had one person here not too long ago. I wish she was like fourteen or fifteen, and she was diagnosed with breast cancer. So I would say, you know, even after you started your menstrual cycles, mm -hmm. to you know just massage your breast in that um, clockwise motion and see if you feel any lumps. I wouldn't say do it around the time that your cycle is on because, you know, sometimes when we have our menstrual cycle, your breasts get tender anyway. Uh -huh. And you may feel lumps in your breast, but it's due to the hormones in your body form because your menstrual cycle is getting ready to come on. Right. And that was one thing that I went through um, in my journey afterwards, breast cancer. Girl, it looked like I would go back and forth to the doctor and I would be like, my breast hurting, you know, because I'm scared, you know, because, you know, I went through this traumatic thing, and any time my breast would hurt, you know, I would be running to the doctor. She's like, you're fine. It's okay. But any time I understand what you're going through, you know, if you feel like you need to come in and see me, you come in. She's like, but you're fine. What you're experiencing is, you know, your cycle's getting ready to come on, and your breasts are going to get tender, and you may feel a little lumpy in your breast. And she said, since your breasts are so dense, she said, you're definitely going to feel it, you know, because my breasts are not full, full, you know, but she calls them dense breasts. So um, what started making me just be more proactive in it, you know, is that. So I would say to the ladies this, to get checked, you know, even if it's your husband's, you know, let them feel it. If you wanted to get a second, do you feel that? You know, do you feel what I feel? If he says no, then, you know, you probably not feel nothing. But if you want to get it checked, you know, and especially if you have a family history, I would say to start before you turn 40. Okay. And just let your doctor know that you do have a family history and you need to get checked. And then your insurance will cover it. But 
I would just do the shower checks or if I'm laying on my, flat on my back in my bed at night, you know, just check your breast every month, you know, to make sure you're not feeling anything, but preferably after the cycle goes off. Okay. And then, like you said, for men, you know, because they do say that men can get it. And I just had that situation that um, with my 17-year-old and his breast, his chest, pectoral muscles had a knot in them, and he was hurting. Girl, I flew my baby to the doctor. Did so, you? Well. Now, he's not a girl, you know, and they said that I, if I did have a girl child, it, they wouldn't be susceptible to the breast cancer. But even though men could get it, but took him to the doctor, they said he was going through puberty, and that's why he had the knots in his chest, and that's why he was in pain. I didn't know that boys do that, you know. Wow, yeah, And yeah. he was... Yeah, so even with your boys, you know, when they tell you their chest hurting or you feel a knot in it, you know, get them checked, you know, just to be on the safe side, not thinking breast cancer, you know, but just being safe, you know, because of my history, you know, I took them to the doctor and she said, oh, yeah, she's like, it's bad, you know, but that's what it was. She said he was going through puberty and then right after that, his voice started changing, so. Wow, yeah. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. so I would just say just be proactive and just check you know, to see and make sure everything is okay, you know. And then especially after you turn 40 to go. And that's even like with men, they're scared to go to get the prostate check or whatever. But women, they're scared because people sometimes just give you the option that um, it's going to hurt. And true enough, when they do put you up on there and they flatten it real tight, it's just to make sure that they're getting everything and they're seeing everything. So, you know, you just do what they tell you to do, suck your breath in, and it doesn't hurt nearly as bad as it would, you know. So I guess once you start getting into it, you know, and do the right position the way they tell you to do, it's not as bad. Right. But it's something that you should do. Yeah. Especially after you turn 40 if you don't have family history. Yeah. And I just see, even for me, I recently went and I was, um, you know, the machines, I guess, from back in the day. <laughs> uh -huh. I know they talk about those, but that one I got, I'm so very grateful. It's a 3D where I go. So they were just like, uh -huh. the machine is totally different. But they said it, you know, back in the day, it was just horrible. So yeah. I said, you know, praise God for new technology. Exactly. Um, but just like the one you, I have, it just flips you around. Don't flip you around, but it just turns and, you know, it just mashes it in but it's like you said it's not hurtful like it used to be yeah so i said if they could you know endure back in the day i think we can you know endure what it is now because it really isn't anything just like you said it is a hold your breath and they may tell you they'll tell you well okay i'll tell you when you can stop you know when you need to hold your breath yeah. or you know and 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 it's worth to me it's worth it um just like you were saying you know do it for your family do you know find a reason why you know, exactly. that's beyond yourself. And I feel like, you know, that would that would be a reason for you to do it, even if, you know, you may be afraid. I mean, to and, and I think some people because they don't want to know um, it's the fear of, you know, yeah. if I do, I'm giving permission for it to happen. No, you're giving permission. So you won't have to deal exactly. with it, you know. So I, I definitely agree with you, um, you know, about just, you know, just go get a check. I mean, just do it. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to um, segue into the topic as it relates to culture vibes. And, um, you know, Shanika, I actually want you to touch on something you mentioned, uh, dealing with uh, Cam Newton uh -huh. with the comment. <laughs> and, and so I really want you to touch on that. I was just thinking about it. You know, I mean, from I hadn't I hadn't actually seen the footage, but I did um, hear about it and, and exactly kind of what was said. Um, and they quoted him and how he, he said it. And so, did have you seen it? Or did you, you, you actually saw him say it? Yeah, I saw it actually today when I got on the computer on my lunch break. And I was looking at it again. I just saw the comment, you know, yesterday. Yeah. But I just actually saw the video today. And to me, like I was telling my co-worker, um, I would say that... Um, I watch football, and I like football, but a route, I wouldn't have called it a route. 
know what I'm saying? Okay. And my boys, and like the question she asked him, um, I can't even remember her exact words, but she was like, um, something about your routes. What do you find is helps you with your routes or something to that effect? So yeah. he was like, oh. You know, he had his little smile. You know how he got his little swagger, you know. Mm -hmm. And it could have made you think if you knew or if you, you know, were in your feelings, you would have been like, yeah, he's being kind of snubbing her, you know. But to me, being a female myself and a woman, I wouldn't have knew what a route was unless I would have researched it. You know, and if I had used that term or language with him, if he had said that, I would have been like, yeah, you know, I researched it, you know. But, but her being a, a sportscaster, or whatever her title is, you know, and her using that word, you know, I think he probably could have worded a little different. But me, myself, I don't think it should have been taken as offensively as it was, you no. know. And now the man is losing money from off his table to feed his family all because of something that he said, you know. Right. And I, I just, I think it was kind of blown out of proportion. Just like Fox 6 yesterday, they had the poll on there. And it asked, do you think Cam was out of line? Do you think what he did was unacceptable? And, you know, like 6 or 7% said no. You know, I just think it was totally blown out of proportion. You know, and... If you probably asked her, you know, depending on how long she's been doing it, I'm quite sure she probably did research what a route is. Because my boy played football, and, you know, when they dodge somebody and do that, they'd be like, man, did you see how I faked him out? You know, that's the way I understand it. I wouldn't have knew what the term route was. I wouldn't have worded it like that, you know what I'm saying, by me being a woman, because I don't know what a route is. Right. Men probably know what a route is, and I'm not even for sure if a man probably would have called it a route, you know, and that's probably why he got kind of, you know, was smiling and like, why she used use that term was you could have just said like, um, but I guess like she, like I said, she probably be a professional, so she probably had to research what he's doing and say the word route, but me is talking with my boys. I would have been like, dog, you faked him out when you was running down the field, you know, you went that way, you went this way, you know. That's just me in my way of looking at it. Yeah. But, you know... And and I guess and, I, I guess I want to ask this too, you know, with that because I I did hear about him losing some, and I I saw an, another friend on Facebook posting um about it because they compare, you know, of course what he did versus what the president said, and was like, uh -huh. you know, he loses um. <laughs> she worded it kind of like you know this is what happened then he loses endorsements but it's like yeah. this is what this person said and then they become president she was like America like you crazy you know because yeah. <laughs> and then they like... even went so far as to use um they done went back and studied her um they went back on her and where she used this racist comment towards some guy at some college when she was interviewing him Oh my. And, you know, like, what was done to her, you know, did you all do anything to her? So now the race card is coming in, you know, he's black, he done lost his endorsement. But that wasn't a racial term that he used. She used a racial term with the guy on college that played football, and she still has her job. So, you know, it's like this climate now, you know, of race, and it's just, um... I think you said you were going to ask the question about that. Yeah. I want to talk about it. Well, yeah, no, I mean, you could go ahead. Like, with it, I, I definitely want to, um, with the climate being racial, you know, just, you, you know, what are some things you, you know, you believe, like, can be done to be helpful to move us towards the right path? Because that's really what, I mean, I know people, you know, they'll, I guess, like, those who oppose even the race car, you know, they'll say, well, you know, you're using the race car. But sometimes yeah. it's blatant racism. Like, it's not something you got to try to figure out. Like, is that racism? Like, it's yeah. like, no, that's, it's, you're not, or it's a double standard. It's a not exactly. treated, you're not treated the same way as this person. Like, you know, and it is what it is. Like, you can't. I mean, you can't make stuff. Some stuff you can't make up. It just is. Yeah. Like, this is what it is. But yeah, but I, you know, what what are your thoughts on like, you know, what are some things that could be helpful to move us in the right direction? 
Um, my way of looking at it, I just think that if everybody just, you know, kind of, I wouldn't say calm down and let your guard down, but, you know, you got to stay like what the time is they're using now, stay woke. Yeah. You know, you can't get your mind off of the sight at hand, you know, we're trying to move forward and not go back into, you know, Martin Luther King days, not saying it was a negative time, but it was a time where black people experienced a lot, you know, hangings, you know, the slavery, and to me it's just a different form of what we're going through now as to what the people went through with the whippings and the beings then, you know, now it's the arresting and the killings, you know, as to back then, it was slavery and the beatings and the lynchings, you know, but it's just happening to me in a different form. That's the way I'm looking at it. But I'm not for sure if other people are saying it like that. And I just think, you know, they do things now to try to get your mind off of it mm. and to distract you. You know, it's a distraction because, you know, eight years ago when Obama was in office, you know, you weren't hearing about all this, you know, different stuff that's going on today. Mm -hmm. And if it was there, it wasn't as blatant as it is now, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. That's even like with the president, you know, with the different things that he's doing and saying, you know, and tweeting. And um, with Colin Kaepernick, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name right, but him kneeling. He wasn't kneeling for what they say he's kneeling for, and now he's being blackballed. I really think they're blackballed at man, but um, and him not being able to get work now, and because they're taking it to a whole nother level, you know, because he was kneeling for the injustices like Sandra Bland and Eric Garner and all those people, but now they're saying it's the flag right. and the people who then fought wars. It's not about that because, you know, I was listening to Steve Harvey the other morning and um, one lady, she said she's in the services. She said it doesn't offend her that they're kneeling. She was like, because it's things that are happening even with them. She was like, it's some people, they go out to fight, you know, and they don't even get their money, don't even be in their accounts for their families, you know. Right. So she was like, you know, they're doing more of an injustice to us by us serving the country and our money is not there. And then you come home and you're injured. And she said that it's mold and stuff in the ceilings at the place um, in that. Washington. Uh -huh. So, you know, you're doing an injustice to the people who go out to fight for this country. But you're sending the trillions and trillions of dollars across the world. But you can't take care at home. So it's things like that, you know, that you have to look at and not look at the race thing, you know, because I just think that's a distraction to take your focus off of what's really going on in the world. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, um, you know, just like they're saying, Donald Trump is racist and he's bringing all the people in and then the Russia situation and then now you got the thing that went on in Las Vegas and, you know, they're saying that it had to be the government because he couldn't have loved all those letters. It's, it's just a smoke screen. It's just like with the Russia thing going. It was so close to Trump being impeached not too long ago. And then here comes Russia coming to the United States. You know what I'm saying? Stuff like that that happens to take your mind off of everything, you know. And like this now, I just think it's a smoke screen to take your mind off of what's going on in Puerto Rico. And you got a president in office who claims he didn't know that Puerto Rico was a part of the United States. Really? Okay. You know, yeah, it's like it's things like that that make you think, you know, <laughs> what are we doing, you know? This is, it's like the Twilight Zone. Yeah. You know what I mean, it really so, like you like, okay, or or like that show Pumped it used to be back in the day with MTV. It's like, where is Ashton Kutcher at? Like, he going to jump exactly. out. <laughs> Kutcher. Like, he's going to jump out of somewhere. Because this is a joke. Y'all yeah. video, like, you, we're going to wake up. And then yeah. <laughs> exactly. And then as far as our people go, you know, we can't get too complacent, you know, about just standing in one place. You know, some might say, why have you been a teacher for so long? and you know you're not making enough money to do the things that you need to do. It's not that I've gotten complacent. It's what I love to do. You know, a child mm. needs to be taught. 
Mm-hmm. Because they're the future. You know, I just can't, or we can't just let them raise themselves. If that's what's wrong with the kids now, it's like I saw a video on Facebook the other day, and it just took me back to the saying that my grandmother used to say, it takes a village to raise a child. Yeah. You know, and people, how you probably saw on Facebook too, but the kids were at Sunrise Point at the bus stop, and they was running back and forth in the traffic. And one of the tenants in an apartment complex came down. He was like, y'all need to get out the street, you know. And he was saying parents need to get up out the beds and go stand at the bus stop with the kids. You know, like if their parents gone to work and they, you know, because we had plenty of latchkey kids back in the day. I yeah. was one. Yeah, you I know, was too. You know, you had to come home and wait till your mama got home and you better not touch that stove. You better eat something that's right. fixable. <laughs> but, you yes. know, even... Me, I had to leave my oldest son at home, my second oldest, and I told him, don't get on that bus until the bus comes, mm. his bus comes. Mm-hmm. And lo and behold, this lady who I'm now friends with and did not know at that time that she was watching my baby get on the bus while my oldest son bus came. And she was like, you probably didn't know, you know, it's been plenty of mornings that your son bus came, but... I stood here and waited with your baby while his bus came, you know, because she knew he wouldn't have had a way to school if he had to wait on his bus to come if it wasn't running on time. Mm. And me and her are real good friends now, and um, our boys have played football ever since they were little up until now in high school, and I saw I'm playing basketball now. But um, she watched my kids for me while the bus was coming, and because I had to leave because I had to be to work at 7.30. Yeah. So she was down the bus stop. So I say all this to say, you know, we have to help one another. You know, if I got to be to work, you need to make friends with your neighbors. Everybody just go about their busy way and do things, and they just walk in their house closed the door. They don't get, but the world is so crazy now. You're scared to get to know people. Like where back in the day, if I did something at school and if my neighbor knew about it, they're going to whoop me, then I'm going to get a whooping when I got home. Right. That's the way it was back in the day. But now you take somebody as kid, you're going to be dead. Yeah, pretty much. Because you they might, don't want to fight you because you're going to put your hand on their kid and their parents don't want the teachers or the principal to whoop the children at school. They done took the paddling out of school. They done took the, the um, Pledge of Allegiance out of school. And if you pay attention, that's when everything started going bad. I think, you know, back after the um, space shuttle thing. I think I was in like, I was like, I went to high school in 92, no, 88. So the, the space shuttle thing was like in the late 80s, wasn't it? Was it 88, 89 when the space shuttle crashed? And then shortly after that, they took the Pledge of Allegiance out of school. And then that's when they had the Columbine thing. And ever since then, all this stuff has been transpiring because you took God out of school. You can't take God out of the equation. Mm, yeah. So, you know, it's just a thing, you know, where you just have to pay attention to the signs, you know. And if you don't pay attention to the signs, that's at anything in life. If you want to stop signs, you liable to have an accident. So if you're not paying attention to the signs, then you're going to have an accident in life. And I think that's what's happening now. Yeah. You know, nobody's paying attention. Everybody's just doing their own thing. And whether it's race or, you know, whatever your livelihood, you know, you're just waiting on somebody to hand it to you. You know, you have to get up and you have to go and try to get it, you know, whether you have to work two jobs. Because even now with me, you know, I might do a little sitting job on the weekend or maybe through the week, you know, just to have extra money, you know, besides what I make, you know. And like I said, you know, um, You just have to look at the whole big picture, you know, and my grandma, you tell me you have to think outside the box. You know, you can't always just be going about life, you know, just doing things the same way all your life. You know, you have to think, you know, in different ways so you can get different results. That's what she used to always tell me. Well, that's, I I definitely agree. And, you know, it's something about those grandmothers that you usually you know, just have those, uh, what I call those pearls of wisdom to share. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, I that's just. Because I'd be like, Lord, Jesus, I miss my grandma so much now because she used to give me some negative wisdom, you know, to get me through the hard times. Because mm-hmm. that's what she used to tell me. She used to tell me, you know, 
and I would call and I would ask her some of the, some things that she would say, you know, would just be so profound, you know, like, you going through life using a tablespoon, you should have been using a teaspoon. If you're using a tablespoon to do stuff and you should have been using a teaspoon, you're getting too much, that's why it ain't right. You know, that's like if you're using the wrong size thing to make a cake, the cake ain't going to turn out right because you're doing it wrong. So, you know, in life, you know, we do stuff wrong, and that's the reason why it don't turn out right. And when she told me that, I was like, what the heck? Right. <laughs> I was like, that makes so much sense, the way she broke it down, you know. So, yeah, it's stuff like that I miss that she would say, you know, like, why buy the cow when you get the milk for free if you're living in a relationship, you know, where you're not married. And you want to be married, you know, and you're single and you're um, African-American female, you know, and you're just waiting like me, myself now. I'm ready to be married and I feel like I've cleared all the things up in my life and I've made and forgiven people for things they may have done to me. And I feel like, you know, I've cleaned myself up. Um, one man, I forget what his name is. I want to say he's a thunder, um, what the man name is, Joel Osteen, you know, the um, black minister that comes on. Yes, uh, uh, Pastor John Gray. Uh, Pastor John Gray. Probably so. I'm not for sure what his name is. He did a thing on Facebook Saturday morning. And oh my God, I was sitting at the barbershop with my boys getting their hair cut. And I was like, I get tired of coming to this barbershop, Lord. I was like, when is my help me go come? You know? Mm -hmm. And girl, his thing, his sermon came on. They had a little clip of it on Facebook. I was on Facebook while I was sitting in the barbershop. And he was like, some of us are always go into relationships and we're not clean. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you can't go in a relationship with baggage. You know, he's like, if you're clean, if you're dirty, you need to get clean. And he gave the story of where his daughter um, had had an accident and her pull-up, and she tried to clean herself up and said she had stuff everywhere, in the room, in the carpet, on the walls, in the bathroom, with the wipes, and said she just had them walked all through her bedroom and, and other parts of the house and just had stuff everywhere. So he said, the house is your temple your body and he was saying sometimes we get into accidents in life and we get stuff all over us you know and you have to get yourself cleaned up and to make a long story short he was saying that um you can't do a surface cleaning before you're trying to go into a relationship and you know if you're waiting patient on God to send it who it is that is for you because he said that's the reason why sometimes we be in all these different relationships because we just did a surface cleaning. He said we need to do a deep cleaning. And girl, when he said that, I was like, oh my Lord. Right, yeah. And he was like, you got to repeat these words and say, you know, Lord, if there's anything that I haven't forgiven somebody for, if I'm not completely clean, clean me. And God will send who it is that it is for you. I get so tired of going to the barbershop, I'd be like, Lord, so now my son, he started driving me like, I'd be glad when you start driving, and I can trust you just to drive yourself to the barbershop, you know. Right. But um, to your question about the single women in our race, you know, um, I think that's what it is, you know, and then I was talking to a friend of mine that lives in um, Las Vegas, Nevada, and he was saying that... Um, we were talking about soul ties and you know how women and men, well, more so men don't have to deal with it like a woman does. And I was telling him I had went to a seminar and it was talking about single women. And if you can't get to the point where you can date yourself and be single and be happy, you're not ready to be in a relationship. That's what the lady said in the seminar. And I was like, I don't see myself taking myself to the movies or going out to eat dinner by myself and just sitting in the restaurant, you know. And then when I tried, I was like, okay, I can do this, you know, because you don't have to be bothered with nobody, especially if you're not ready to be in a relationship. And sometimes, you know, we just hop from this relationship to that one, and then three, four months down the line, you're having trouble. And he says, because you haven't cleaned yourself. And mm -hmm. so she gave the analogy as to where... um 
a woman's body when she's dealing with soul ties is like that new suit that you put on, you go by. And if you haven't cleaned yourself up in in relief of all the soul ties that you have in your body, it's like that new suit got a piece of gum on it. And you just constantly picking, trying to get all that gum off that suit. You use peanut butter, you use ice, all the things that people tell you can get gum off a suit, but it's not really ever going to come completely off because of those soul ties. And I was like, oh my God, that's so clear. Yeah. You know, to understand. And some people don't believe that soul ties are real. That's the reason why women act so crazy and they go and bust these men and wonder and flatten their tires and do all this old crazy stuff like stalking and all this kind of stuff is because you got soul ties. And I saw a picture somewhere, I don't know if it was on Facebook or somewhere, but it's a picture of a woman's body and it's cut down from the neck all the way down. You can see all these different bodies coming out when she opened herself up. And I think that's the way we are, you know, because another thing she used was a woman's body was like an ATM machine. You have everything inside of you, but when you get with a man and they're not using protection and he's depositing his semen into your body, he's depositing all of his DNA and all the DNA from other women that he's been with. And that's the reason why you have all those different spirits and souls in your body. Mm, yeah. I was yeah. like, no, that's deep. Yeah, Because you're just not is. dealing with that man. You're dealing with every woman he done been with, every man that that woman who he's probably cheating on you with, if he's married or if he has more than one woman, you're not just dealing with him. It's everybody he done dealt with, and you wonder why you're acting so crazy. Mm-hmm. And when she said that, I was like, Lord, this was really worth my money to come in to this single seminar and get this because it was so transforming just to think about it that way if you just open your mind up and you can receive what it is you know that they're saying so as far as us as women I would say you know you just have to be patient you know because the Bible says a man that finds a woman finds a good thing and you know we going out to the club and trying to find this man it's not going to be the man that God sent for you because you're out there in the wrong places and I would say this for myself because it was like a light bulb for me. And I was like, I go to work. Back then I was going to school and church. And that's all I did. And a friend of mine told me, she was like, how are you going to find you a best where you at? You got to put yourself out there, you know, but not in the places that you would go to find the wrong person. She said, you might find them at, see them at Walmart, you know. But if you're just going home every day, you ain't going to meet nobody at home. You think you're going to come knocking on your door, you know. And I was like, that makes sense, you know. But it's just so much different now from when, you know, you first started dating guys. It's not the same. People take you out on a date now. You don't want nobody coming to your house. You want to meet them there because people come to your house, they start stalking, you know, or you can't get rid of them. Or even kidnapping and killing and all these people meeting people online and going on dates, you know, it's just a change of time. So you have to be careful, you know, and that's just common sense. But at the same time, you know, you know, just take the time to get to know a person. You don't just have to be so single and um, I want to say desperate. I don't want to use it too harsh, but you know. To just and me now, I don't bring nobody around my kids. If I'm going out on a date, I'm meeting you out and about. Nobody's gonna know why I stay because if it doesn't work out, then my kids are seeing this guy. They can be like, mm, here come another one. You know what happened to the last one? You know. So you have to be careful in all areas when you're dating. Yeah. I would say, but I would just say, just to take your time and you know know your value. You know and don't lower your value to be what this person is because you like them so much that, you know, you think if you lower your standards, it's going to work because it's not. Yeah. So I just say, you know, know your work and know exactly what it is you're looking for. Yeah. No, that's good. That's good advice. Well, all right. Yeah. 
Well, we're going to um, to segue into um, the topic mother-daughter bonds. And um, it's basically a series of questions that I'll ask you. And it's kind of, kind of, it. well, what it does is encourage conversation um, among mothers and daughters. And I also believe it's a good way for our audience to get to know um, our guests. So are you ready? Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, what has your mother taught you about yourself? She taught me that. I need to be strong and that it's okay, you know, to ask questions, you know, and not to be, I would, I would say I was shy, you know, when I was younger and um, I would be quiet, you know, and I wouldn't talk to my mom as much. But then once I started getting older, you know, and um, I guess after my parents divorced, it was like I shut down, you know, and so once I started growing up, and then, you know, my mother was the woman that she was, and I watched her. And I think that's where the strength came from, that scene, and then she telling me, you know, what it is to do and what to look for, you know. So I just think girls, you know, they don't need to be so headstrong and fast, you know, as my grandma would say, and wanting to get out there in the streets, you know, just sit down and listen to what your parents are trying to teach you, especially your mom, because, you know, they'll tell you certain things because they don't want you to go through what they went through. And I use this as an example when my mom, when I introduced my mom to my second kid, my second set of kids, dad, my last three boys, dad, she's like, "Mm mm-mm. And I heard her say, "Mm mm-mm, you know. (laughs) But I was like, "Uh Uh, uh-huh. I know, right. (laughs) And not knowing that she had that intuition to know, you know, no, that's not who it is for you. Right, right, right. And then, you know, I just kept on forward with the situation. And, girl, that was the worst (laughs) years of my life because I didn't listen to her, "Mm mm-mm. I had three kids, and I love my boys to death, you know, and uh, I would trade that part of the relationship for nothing, but if I had to listen to that, mm-mm, uh-uh, right. then, you know, <laughs> you know, you get what I'm saying, but girl, it was the worst, oh my God, we dated from, I'm um, 99, I met him in 98, I had my first child by him in 99, and um, the second one in 2000, and the third one together in 2002 and it was so much going on you know because um he was in and out of jail and um the women and the, um not wanting to work because he was used to the fast life you know selling drugs and stuff and I didn't know that until afterwards you know we got involved and I was like you have to get a job and you don't have to go you know he got a job he started working and everything, you know, but it was just like he was so used to that fast money, he couldn't, he didn't want to work for real, you know. But then he started getting in the habit of working and everything, you know. And another thing my grandmother taught me was you never give a man an ultimatum. And I gave him an ultimatum in 99, in the 99, I told him, I was like, we don't get married and um, I'm, you're going to have to get out. We're not going to be living together, you know, you got to go, you know. Girl, that boy went and got a ring and just to shut me up talking about the marriage thing. And so, you know, we were making plans and whatever. And a year goes by, two years go by, still hadn't just made it official, you know, making Mm -hmm. plans but never official. And so that's what I was telling you my grandma had told me. Why buy the cow when you get the milk for free? Uh Why get married? He getting everything that he can get in a marriage now, and y'all just living together. So why get married? Right. And when she told me that, it was like another aha moment. Okay, I get what you're saying. And so, um, fast forward, second baby, third baby, and, you know, that's when it started getting just bad, you know. And I was like, one New Year's in 05 it was, I think, that we broke up. And I said, Lord, I said, if you get me out of this relationship, I would never go back and pick it up again. I said, I just need you to get me out. And girl, I went to church that night. That next day, I was in jail. Wow. 
And that was the way I got out of the relationship. My grandma was like, you are specific in your prayer. I know. What'd you say? I was like, what? She <laughs> said you want to specific. She was like, you just said you didn't care how he got you out of this relationship to get you out. And I got out by going to jail. Because, honey, when I came back home, I was a packing sister. I mean, I packed all his stuff up and took it to his sister's house. So my thing is when you start seeing the warning signs, whether it's verbal, physical, mental, it's time for you to go, you know. Yeah. And that's the point that it had got to for me. It started getting physical, verbal, you know, lying to my mom about this and that, you know. And um, I just had to let it go, you know, because it wasn't worth it, you know. And... um. It's just bad. So I would tell the women too, you know, you know, don't just accept anything, you know. You know what you want and if that's not what you're being given, then you know you need to move on. Sometimes it's easier said than done and it also depends on your strength, which is you get from your mother. If you see your mother getting beat on all the time, you might think that that's the norm. Or if you see your mom working, doing all that she can do to make ends meet, then that's what you pick up on, you know. And I really believe that, you know, whatever vibe is given, that's what you get, you know. Okay. And I think that's why so many young girls think it's okay to be in a relationship where they're being beaten because their moms probably took that, you know. And that's all they know because if their mom can tell you, you don't let a man put their hands on you, then you're not going to know that it's not okay. Right. You know, but if your mom and your dad taught you, which is why what my dad always did tell us was that we were beautiful. So right. um, if you've heard that on a constant basis, when a guy comes to you and tell you that, you'd be like, okay, thank you, you know. But they'd be like, oh, that's all you got to say? And I'd be like, I heard that before. It's not going to make me drop nothing no quicker to be with you because I was giving that every day. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So if a girl wasn't told by her father, her mother, that she was pretty or, you know, what her worth was and what she don't have to do or listen to a man say, then she knows what to not fall for. You get what I'm saying? Right. And so I, and for I do the girl wanna... who hadn't heard that she's pretty from her father, then when a man tells her she's pretty, she's going to accept that and she's going to run with it for whatever it's worth. Right. You know, yeah, and so a man only tells you, and you probably heard before, what you want to hear. And if that's what a girl wants to hear because she's never heard it before, that's what she's going to be looking for. Right. And and I did want to ask you, though, but how did your um, relationship with your mother prepare you to become, in the, to become the woman that you are today? I think it prepared me, like I said, by her being divorced and then having to raise us by herself, you know, just with $200 child support, which is not enough by any means, you know, even back then, you know, just seeing her do what she did and everything, I just think that it prepared me. And sometimes I think I'm too strong because even when I see what I went through with the breast cancer or what I go through now raising my boys, I don't feel like I can break down. I can't, you know, crumble. You know, I got to keep going, keep going, keep going. And then if you do that, you know, when you really need the help, there's nobody there because they see your strength all the time. They never see you weak and vulnerable, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I think the strength is a good thing, but still at times you need to let somebody know that you need help as well. And I don't think it's pride so much. I just think that's what I know, you know. And it's never to give up, never to stop. All right. Well, what keeps yeah. you... Oh, okay. What keeps you grounded? My boys and my belief in God and everything. And reading my book, I read every morning. I think I've read it now two times. It's the 31 Days of Praise. All right. So it's a different you know, thing that um, you read every day. And another book that I like to read is called God Will Carry You Through. Okay. And I also still journal <laughs> every day at 43 years old. That's awesome. I, I still I like to write in my journal. You know, it kind of keeps me 
thing. That's my way of releasing on paper. Okay. You know. That's so, good. yeah, I like to write in my journal. So, those things, I think, you know, it keeps me grounded. Cool. And read my Bible in the morning. Sometimes, you know, even after the breakup with him, you know, I had to fall asleep with the Bible sometimes, you know, just to keep me where I needed to be because, you know, sometimes you get in that little crying spell and be like, you know, wasted all this time with this person when you could have been doing something else. You know, it's just another point of things that you have to go through to get where you need to be because if you don't learn a lesson, then you really just did something just to be doing it because you always, I think, should learn a lesson through something that you've gone through. So it's prepared you for the next phase, you know. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, what is something that every woman should try once in her lifetime? I would think, like I just said, we're talking about, you know, being, dating yourself, go out by yourself. And, you know, and I feel like if you can do that, um, then I think you're on the right path, you know. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Well, what superpower would you like to have? Superpower? Yes. Uh, I think to be able to see what's coming next. You know, then it won't hit you so hard when you get there. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the ability to be able to see what's coming so I won't be so surprised, you know. But then, you know, if you um, think about it that way, then that would then one be an element of surprise, you know. I think that's another thing that keeps us, you know, guessing and wanting to see what's going to be next in life. You know, it's not being able to know everything, but I think that would be mine to be able to see. you like to have. Okay. What's the most important lesson that you've learned within the last year? Within the last year is to... Be able to pay attention to the things that are going around you, you know, and not take everybody for their word. And um, something I'm dealing with now, you know, and that's um, rebuilding my credit. And um, I could have been further along, you know, and I hate to bring this up, but I had went to a bank Mm -hmm. and um, the man told me, he said, well, I wouldn't want to um, arbitrarily tell you to get this card when it might not be beneficial to you. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, well, the lady told me I need to get a secured credit card. So why would he tell me not to get a secured credit card? And when the guy broke it down to me, who I talked to, and he's really good with breaking things down, mm-hmm. um, when I call him, I need help. But he's real deep into building your credit. And he was like, they don't want us to know what it is that we can do to get on top. They want us to see us completely stay where we are. Because if we get that wealth power, then they know that we're on the right track to becoming something greater. And I got to thinking about that, and I was like, oh my God, that's kind of crazy, you know. But then when you just look at it, you know, why did he not want me to get a secured credit card if that's what's going to help fill me up. Right. So that lesson that I learned that day is that you can't just listen to everybody, especially when somebody's told you what to do. And if they send you in the direction which is telling you to do something and you can't get it, you need to find another way to get it. So that's the lesson I've been learning as far as the past six months and building my credit power in I would tell anybody now that my credit score is up and I'm able to get things more than what I didn't have, don't ever, you know, take your credit for granted, you know, because you need it, because you can't get anything without it, you know. And if you're just going things for things with just cash, you know, you're really hurting yourself because you need that rotating credit, you know. Because if you're buying stuff with just cash, like he told me, and I was like, oh, that's deep. He said, it's just like if I go to the power wash and they just wash my car with water. When my car dries, it's still going to be dirty. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's 
that's deep, you know. Because he said, everybody know that you need soap to clean stuff, you know. So if you need credit to get what you need, you can't just use cash because cash is just like water sitting on dirt. If you don't put some soap on your body and clean your body, you still going to stink when you get through taking a bath. So yeah. And that's I was like, true. wow, I said, that's deep. Because you can't just wash thing. your body with just water every day and think that you're going to clean yourself because you still don't have a smell because you didn't use the dishwashing liquid or the washing powder to get whatever it is that you need to get clean. So that's a lesson I learned, and it's just something, it's, it's mind-blowing what the credit, how much credit can move stuff for you. You know, because some people think, oh, I bought this for cash and everything in my house paid for, you know. But if you don't have that rotating credit that these creditors are looking for when you're trying to buy a house, you ain't got nothing because you're pay for everything with cash. Wow. That's and good. it is so important, you know, now that I'm learning that lesson, it's just been a six month time just sitting down listening to him and him just breaking things down, you know, and to a form where I can understand it. It's been enlightening, you know, just to just you know that you can talk to a person, you know, and they are able to connect with you and tell you the things that you need to learn because other people probably won't tell you what you need to know because they don't want you to have it, you know. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Awesome. We're going to move on to the topic as it relates to community service, and I wanted you to share um, a few ways that you're giving back to the community. Um, I would say more so through my church. Um, we have, you know, clothes drives, you know, where I've been cleaning out my closet and just taking things that we can use to give to other people, and we do the um, bags for people during the holidays, you know, and that's one way that, you know, we've been helping. I've been helping deal with even, you know, just stepping out a little more, doing things differently, you know, through the community. So I would say, like, for the food drives that we do at our church and the clothes drive. Okay. Awesome. Well, we're going to move into our closing segment, and it's called Matters of the Heart Moment. And the first question is, if you had the opportunity to speak to your four-year-old self, what would you say to her? Oh, oh let me see. If my parents tell me I was something else when I was four, so I don't know. <laughs> um, I would say, I would probably say to her to not be, I don't know if I would say that, though, because they told me I was a leader when I was little, so I don't know, but the things that I did, they say I did, I would think now um, would be dangerous, you know, so... um I would say to still, you know, move and do things like I was doing it, you know, but to enjoy life more than being so focused on, you know, being like an adult. Cause my granddad, he always called me grandma, but he told me I was doing things that an older person would do. Okay. So I would say to enjoy childhood more. Because he told me when I was four, he gave me four quarters, and we lived in Montgomery at the time. And he told me I took those four quarters, and he said it was six kids walking behind me going up Gaston Avenue in Montgomery. That's like a main drag if you're familiar with Montgomery. And um, you get off the interstate. Um, it's not the Court Street exit. It's the Fairview Avenue exit. But we lived off of Gaston Avenue. But when I came out of our apartment complex, and these kids were following me because I had money. And, you know, back in the 70s, early 80s, McDonald hamburgers was like a quarter, I think. So I had money, so I took these kids to McDonald's, and we went and got hamburgers to eat. So my parents were looking for me, and my granddad was like, well, I gave them some money. And so they were asking the neighbors, and they were like, yeah, we saw them going that way. And my granddad, he could tell the story. He was like, well, Grandma, you had those children. You was gone, and you took them up there. And they came to McDonald's, and they looked for us, and he said we were standing up at the counter trying to get some hamburgers. <laughs> wow. So it was that, you know, I wasn't being a child, you know. It was like I was doing something that grown people would do because I was always wanting to take care of others. Yeah. So I would say, you know, just be a 
I should have been a child more. But I guess that was just in me. I don't know. And even still now, I'm a nurturer. And I try to look out for people, you know, and then you still don't get that back, you know, like you do. But um, I think it's just always been in me to be a nurturer and to try to help others, you know. So that's basically what I think I, my answer would be to mm-hmm. enjoy your childhood. Okay. Well, who inspires you? Oh, let me see. My mom and this lady that I know. And um, she's been a a good friend to me in ways that she probably didn't think that she had been. And um, she's a breast cancer survivor too, but she used to live in the neighborhood that I used to live in. And um, she um, would come by my house and she would um, blow the horn and then the boys would be outside ready to leave or whatever. And she would always say, you know what, I admire you for the things that I see you doing. And she didn't even know me. And then I had, had my breast cancer surgery. She would come over and she would help me fold my clothes and just do something. And even now she'll pick up the phone and call me and... Um, or invite me over to her church or whatever to come fellowship or whatever. But she really inspires me because she always have an uplifting word, you know, for me. And then as far as my mom goes, she's just been there day one, you know. And then with my breast cancer treatments, you know, she was there. I mean, she only missed only one. And then that one she missed, she had somebody there with me which was her best friend, coming in to take me to my treatment. So, yeah, great inspiration, you know. And I always will be appreciative for everything they did. So that's my mom and um, Minister Zathia Turner. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, do you have any last-minute comments that you'd like to make? Um, I would just like to say, you know, to... Everybody, you know, in the wake of things, you know, just keep your head up and try not to lose focus of anything, you know, that's going on around you and just keep focused. And just try to be inspired by your daily actions and just to always try to get a lesson out of the things that you're doing on a daily basis. Awesome. Well, Shanique, you know, we definitely want to thank you so much for being with us and just being so transparent. And thank you. I'm willing to just share. So it's it's been really awesome. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. I think a few years ago, you probably got this out of me. Ah, well, I'm so glad <laughs> so I really that we... I think that I'm growing, you know, especially, you, know. you know, in my talking. You know, I took a speech class at school. Okay. And I was like, oh, my God, I got to take this speech class. I dread getting up talking in front of people. But the past two years, you know, I feel like that speech class worked, you know, because I've done a breast cancer um, breakfast at our church. And I said, I need to keep doing it every year, you know, to try to build it up more and more. And then we had a women's conference at our church. And I was like, okay, I was over that. So it's like every year, you know, it's like I'm seeing a little bit more budding, you know, going on and growth, you know. And um, it's just funny, you know, how God, you know, grows us and matures us. And I always say he's fickle, you know. I always can find a humor in something that I go through. And it's a lesson, you know. And I laugh about it, you know, because sometimes, you know, some people can't find the humor in it, you know. But, you know... I've been seeing it grow, so it's a good thing. Yeah. And yeah. I enjoy it. Good, I'm good. <laughs> Uh-huh. I know you too. No, I mean that's that's great, and I, I mean I appreciate you for being transparent and sharing that. You know, because uh-huh. somebody else, I, I do, I just believe that you know, when given opportunities, it definitely is to encourage someone else to add value to them, and someone will hear it and it will help them have courage. You know, so so that's what it's about. It's a, it definitely is yeah. about giving back, and this is your way, um, you know, to give back. Um, well, at least one of them. So I appreciate okay. you for sharing. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. 
And our okay. goal, oh yes, and our goal at the Flora Pearl Foundation is to always be a blessing to all of those that we come in contact with by operating with the spirit of excellence. We want to thank you all so much for listening today. And you can visit our website at www.floraperlfoundation.org. We look forward to spending time with you all each week, and we will talk to you soon. Bye.